next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 8260 in the name of Sarah Boyack on World AIDS Day 2013. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Sarah Boyack, if you are ready, seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. World AIDS Day is our chance to celebrate the achievements that there have been, but also mourn those who are no longer with us. And it's important because it's our opportunity to come together in different communities to express our solidarity with people living with HIV and AIDS and their friends and families. And it's still important for us because it's our chance to raise awareness, to highlight the fact that HIV and AIDS are still with us. And it should concern all of us that in a recent poll commissioned by Waverley Care, research showed that more than half the population is unaware of all the ways that the virus can be transmitted, with 11% wrongly believing that it can be passed on by kissing. So we really need to up the effort on prevention and to make sure that information is presented in a relevant way to a new generation. And we need to get the message across that there's effective treatment available. And alongside that, we need to tackle the root causes of prejudice, which prevents people from coming forward and sees them living in isolation. So we need to support the campaign to encourage people to get tested. A quarter of those in the UK don't even know they've been infected, and that's bad in terms of prevention, and it means that they are denied proper social and health support that they need. So today is our chance, and my chance in particular, to thank the staff and the volunteers of all of the charities that support action on HIV and AIDS, and to welcome those who are with us today and to those that I understand will be watching online. I want to thank HIV Scotland for their efforts in promoting accurate information and knowledge about HIV in Scotland. One of their statistics leapt out at me that we've still got nearly one person a day in Scotland being infected. That's one too many. And over the years, I've worked with Waverley Care and been impressed by the range of services they've developed, such as buddying, support networks for families, and support for key groups such as gay men and African diaspora. I want to particularly thank the staff and all their volunteers and supporters who've made that fantastic work possible. And raising funds is a vital part of their work to ensure that they can continue to support people in our communities. And on Sunday when I joined their celebration, I welcomed the fact that Milestone House will be reopening in early January. And it's testament to effective lobbying by Waverley Care and also by the input by the Edinburgh City Council and NHS Lothian for making that happen. Presiding officer, in our visit to Malawi earlier this year, Alex Ferguson and I saw the very practical projects using theatre and radio to promote the prevention of agenda for vulnerable groups. It's something I think we in Scotland can be proud of. The genesis of my motion today goes back to the debate held after the showing of the film Fire in the Blood at the Take One Action Film Festival in October this autumn in Edinburgh. Now, Take One Action asks that after the festival, filmgoers do something specific to change the world. Just one thing, it's a fantastic model of targeted activism in a world where it can seem really difficult to know where to start. Now, Fire in the Blood records the progress that has been made in developing access to affordable HIV treatments for people across the globe. And last month, at our own cross-party group on international development, the campaigning charity Impact AIDS led our discussion. And I particularly want to thank Cathy Crawford, an inspirational campaigner who has done tremendous work to raise awareness on access to affordable treatment. As Impact AIDS put it, global progress has been both brilliant and terrible. Brilliant as a result of global pressure, and we in the UK can take some pride in the action that followed on from the Glen Eagle Summit and our support for action on the Millennium Development Goals. Successful lobbying for access to generic drugs meant there was a breakthrough where we made the goal of affordable medication costing a dollar a day achievable. And investment in health and education in poorer African countries has also had social and economic benefits, particularly for women. So there has been progress. But it's still terrible that in other African countries, not enough progress is being made. And of the 35 million people infected with HIV globally, 
25 million of them live in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's too early to say that we're at the beginning of the end of HIV, but the fact that that's even beginning to be discussed represents the potential that is now possible. Fire in the Blood argues that there's now the threat of new restrictions to cheaper generic drugs through trade regulations, which are being discussed and agreed behind closed doors. So we need to demand transparency in those talks so that affordability of drugs and the needs of those of the HIV across the world drive the conclusions of those trade talks. Our MEPs need our political support and our UK government needs to take a stand and push for solidarity and equality of access to HIV drugs. Access to cheaper generic drugs has saved the lives of millions and crucially, it's also enabled social and economic progress and investment in health and education facilities in some of the world's poorest countries. And we cannot let the clock be turned back on that progress. So on this year's World AIDS Day, we need to redouble our efforts in Scotland and abroad. There has been dramatic progress and we can celebrate that but there's a very long way to go. And I hope today's debate will give heart to campaigners that their work is visible, that we regard it as political important, politically important, and that we acknowledge its impact. So let's all work together to make sure that we start that discussion on the beginning of the end of AIDS, because it's within our grasp, but it needs political action, it needs political progress, and it needs investment to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Now call on Marco Biaggi to be followed by Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The very first time I marked World AIDS Day was in 2002 at a student fundraiser in aid of uh, HIV AIDS charities. Oddly enough, I was, uh, believe it or not, one of the DJs at the, the evening. And I remember the front row uh, was a group of people who were all painted from head to toe in red. And it was quite a, a, a memorable image because it's one of those examples of where joy is used in the face of overwhelming sorrow, like the families of deceased who insist on people wearing bright clothes. And if there wasn't perhaps the greatest amount of somberness then, the next year I visited the US National AIDS Memorial Grove where there was seriousness and reflection to go around. San Francisco had been at the heart of the, what was originally entitled gay-related immune deficiency epidemic. And that naming and the developments that happened led to very, very visible effects on groups of people that had already been marginalized by society. Today, the US still has uh, one million uh, diagnosed HIV AIDS uh, carriers, the, the highest level in the developed world. I, mean, I never myself knew anyone, uh, I've never known anyone to have been diagnosed that, that I'm aware of. I came in a, a later generation when the the so-called gay plague had instead become more like the plague, infecting or having already killed 60 million people around the world. Those are shocking figures that are reminiscent of the kinds of numbers that were present in the, the Middle Ages for the Black Death. Sub-Saharan Africa, as we've heard, suffered particularly badly, having spent decades improving healthcare systems, bringing their life expectancy up a year or so at a time after 1990. HIV AIDS meant that that went into reverse. Life expectancies across sub-Saharan Africa started to fall again. And those countries that had, until that point, had the best healthcare systems often found that those healthcare systems had only helped to spread the disease. As high, some countries have uh, uh, rates of prevalence as high as 30% of all adults. And they had to struggle with companies that put patents before people. And in some cases, you know, you see March 2002, the Thai government it took unilateral action to use generics and the price for treating one person for one month fell from $750 to $30. The US government blacklisted them and it was only the following year that the World Trade Organization agreed a regime whereby developing countries could use generics. Work by campaigners and philanthropists has seen tremendous progress around the world and deaths globally now are down. 2.2 million in 2005, 1.8 million in 2010. But that is still far, far too many. Here in Scotland, we have 5,900 diagnosed and an estimated 1,400 with HIV AIDS, but undiagnosed. 
This is despite the change in average life expectancies of those that have the disease, having made it a, a chronic condition rather than a terminal one. The stigma remains the great barrier, and it always has been. I remember when I was seven in primary school, there was a girl who was bullied, and the, the choice of weapon at the time, as happens in playgrounds, was to say that she had AIDS, that other children wouldn't sit in the same seat as her. And while the adverts of the time were certainly necessary, that is the effect that they have had. We have to now tackle the basis of this stigma, which is the ignorance at the heart of it. I really welcomed the Waverley Care Report. I asked the First Minister, and I was very grateful that he reiterated the Scottish Government's support in their action plan, and indeed the cross-party resolve that I think this debate will show. World AIDS Day is a chance to, to remember the dead, to, to recognise those who continue to live with HIV AIDS, and to work together across all our boundaries to end the scourge once and for all. Many thanks. <clears throat> Now, Colin Jackson Carlo to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Being just a little bit older than Marco, we actually, I was part of a generation who remember very much when AIDS became uh, an illness that affected a great many people. And I have to say, I actually think that the attitude, as a young man out of my teens and going to my early 20s at the time, the attitude of the much older generation that were still alive at that time was so corrosive in its approach to this issue that I think it actually fundamentally changed and altered the attitude of my generation and generations that have come, before, uh, come after to sexual equality and to the way that we look at these matters. Uh, I did have a, a personal experience, albeit at one stage removed, of, of someone who had been at school with me. I wouldn't say he was one of my closer friends. He was one of those with whom in the morning we got together and discussed the previous evening's episode of Monty Python and relived every one of the, the sketches. Um, and I had no idea of what his sexuality was. When he left school, it turned out he was homosexual. He wasn't um, someone who was open about that. He eventually uh, did have sex, and on the one occasion he did, he caught AIDS, and he died from that, and he died from that in misery because his family were ashamed of him and more or less kept him isolated from the family and from the community and from his friends. And I think that that experience, which was not unique, fundamentally changed the whole attitude of, as I said earlier, the generation that subsequently emerged and made us realize that this was an illness that had to be faced and, like all other illnesses which have affected populations, has to have every resource and effort put behind it to defeat it. What I would like to say is that I at times don't wish to distinguish it from all sorts of other sexual diseases that exist. We know that we have appalling rates of chlamydia in society today, and at a school I was speaking at last week, it's clear that many young people don't know that the government actually have a first-class website which is designed to, to try and educate young people in terms which I think they can best understand about sexual health and all the protections and things that they, of which they need to be aware. And, and that is true whether young people are gay or straight, and I think that is the other big difference that everybody is now perfectly open to discussing. And so I think more yet has to be done. I suppose as each new generation of children comes through school, we tend to forget that perhaps we launched something to people who have now left and are off into university and have gone beyond, that we need to make sure that the next emerging generation know that that information is there and that we are constantly updating it and, and making it relevant. I'd also, just by way of a, a second aspect to my contribution, like to commend President Obama for his support of the work that President Bush did in relation to the international aspect of tackling AIDS. Both President Obama and former President Bush were in Tanzania earlier this year. Uh, and it was President Obama who again commended President Bush's President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, where the biggest single donation by any state in history to tackle a disease was committed by President Bush, $15 billion in 2003 to 2008, to prevent 7 million infections across Africa, which Sarah Boyack was talking about, and which has prevented some 1.1 million deaths. Um, I think, you know, while so much more needs to be done, and from, in some senses, I suppose, what some people would regard as an unlikely source, um, that commitment was from President Bush. And I noticed a comment from um, a very leading businessman in Dar es Salaam. You know, we love Obama because his father was an African. He's the first African-American in the White House, and that has inspired us. But the fact is that so far he has not done as much to help Africans as President Bush did. 
We understand he has problems at home, but truly we are still hoping that he will help us more before he retires. And the United States is the international leader in all of this. We play our part as a community, as a country here. So I hope that part of the message from this debate is not just the education and support and everything we do, and I endorse everything Sarah Boyack said, but to send a, a message to the United States to underline, underpin, and further resource that program which is doing so much on the continent of Africa. Many thanks. I now call on Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Jamidi. Thank you very much, President Officer, and can I congratulate Sarah Boyack on securing this debate and recognise her long-standing um, passion for this issue, the work she's done with Waverly Care, but also the work that she's doing overseas now on this issue. Can I draw members' attention to my register of interest, where I'm a member of the Terence Higgins Trust? Um, I've been a member of the Terence Higgins Trust for a long time, and I think that's in part due to um, my sort of coming of age. I, I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s where Mark Fowler was diagnosed as being HIV positive on EastEnders, and that led an, a national debate about what that meant. Freddie Mercury died when I was obsessed with Queen and, and all the rock music around that. You know, my childhood was framed around Band-Aid, and I watched AIDS ravage Africa, uh, and, and it still does in, in many ways. And I think that heightened a political interest for me in, in the HIV AIDS debate, which is why I, I joined um, THT. My membership of THT took a, a different meaning personally when a good friend of mine was diagnosed with HIV uh, two years ago. And uh, it was a bit of a shock. Um, he sat down and he told me, and um, we talked about through all the consequences that that would have for his life, for his job, for his relationship. And then we had a drink, and it was all good, and it was all fine. And then I got up and I went home, and I went home and I cried all night because I knew my friend was going to die. Um, I knew that that wasn't necessarily going to happen tomorrow or in a few weeks' time, but it was going to happen, and the likelihood was that it was going to happen before I did. And I found that really, really hard to deal with. A few months later, um, that same friend was uh, walking to meet me. We were going for a coffee, and he was on his mobile phone, and he accidentally walked into a lamppost, and he, and he um, bashed his nose, and his nose started to bleed. So when he arrived and he met me, he was covered in blood. And it was a despairing moment, moment for him, not for me, because he was so conscious that he was um, covered in this thing, which, which was everything that symbolised his illness. And he felt a great sense that his own, his own body was a danger to me at, at that moment in time. And I could see the despair and the fear that he had in that moment just for our friendship and, and just how I might cope with the fact that he was bleeding and, and what to do about that. President Officer, I share those really personal stories because I think that each of those um, says something um, very significant about the, fate, the challenges we still face around HIV and AIDS. Part of that is stigma, and I think all the speakers are right to have pointed to the great deal of ignorance that still, around, still surrounds HIV AIDS as an issue. And I was ignorant too. Uh, my friend doesn't have to die. Uh, if you have a look at the Terence Higgins report now that's looking at the greying element of the HIV AIDS epidemic, you can live for a very long time and live very well for a long period of time. I was ignorant on that issue, even though I was very engaged in the debate. But also, crucially, and Sarah Boyack made this point, it's about the support services that exist. And I will forever be grateful to Waverly Care and to Terence Higgins Trust for the broadness and the variety of the services that, that they run and they operate, which help my friend. And it's not just around his mental health, it's about the impact on his work, it's about how he can continue to go about his way of life and live his life to the full. So, in conclusion, President Officer, can I just thank Sarah Boyack once again uh, for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber and I thank uh, the members in the Chamber for letting me uh, share those very personal experiences. So, thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat> and I call on Jim Eady to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I too would like to congratulate Sarah Boyack on bringing this important debate to the Chamber this afternoon. And I'm pleased to have this opportunity to contribute and to highlight the work of the recently established HIV Human Rights and Development Network, uh, which I'm privileged to co-convene along with my friend and colleague Kezia Dugdale. Uh, the aim of the network is to run seminars co-hosted by the University of Edinburgh based on cutting-edge research and good practice examples which it is hoped will raise awareness and influence policy outcomes relating to HIV, human rights and development. The network acts as a platform for the exchange of knowledge across different fields, from practitioners and policy makers to interested parties and activists. And the network has the support of a range of partners. These are Scotland's foremost HIV charities, Waverley Care, HIV Scotland and Terence Higgins Trust. In addition, the network has the support of the Church of Scotland HIV programme and Queen Margaret University. 
I would also like to pay tribute to my constituents, Dr George Palatil and Dr Dina Sidva, whose own research and commitment to highlighting these important issues has been instrumental in establishing the network. Their report, uh, They Call Me You Are AIDS, a report on HIV, human rights and asylum seekers in Scotland, gives us a chilling insight into the lives of many HIV positive asylum seekers in the UK, who, and they quote in their report, left behind persecution violence, gang rape and discrimination as they fled their country, seeking to find a place of safety. Unfortunately, many of these vulnerable women and men are met with stigma, financial difficulties and discrimination when they arrive in the UK, making it difficult for them to find a safe place to live. And then there are challenges around accessing health treatment, leaving them susceptible to further vulnerabilities. And one of the issues that was highlighted at the um, seminar last week, which we held in the Parliament, was the fact that someone who is classified by the Home Office as being a person of no status, because they do not have an address, cannot register with a GP practice and cannot access um, health treatment. And that is why, as well as marking World AIDS Day, the theme of which is striving towards an AIDS-free generation, I would also like to highlight Human Rights Day on the 10th of December and International Migrants Day on the 18th of December, which recognises the rights of migrants throughout the world. HIV has been a feature of the developing world for many years, as colleagues have said. In countries like Botswana and Lesotho, nearly a quarter of people aged between 15 and 49 have been diagnosed with the disease. Let me put that into perspective. There are 200,000 orphans living in Lesotho 140,000 of these children have been orphaned because of AIDS, according to UNICEF. And this tragic figure is because only 50% of diagnosed people in the world are able to access antiretroviral therapy due to a variety of factors, ranging, as we've heard this afternoon, from stigma, the lack of a fully developed and accessible healthcare system, to poor rural infrastructure. And I agree with the observation made by Professor Leslie Doyle at the Centre of Health and Social Care at the University of Bristol when she said that the perspective of rich countries, um, from the perspective of rich countries, it is easy to think of the HIV and AIDS pandemic as a thing of the past. But that is not the case as countries in the developing world continue to face a series of epidemics. In the current climate of austerity, funding gaps are becoming wider between the needs of people in the developing world and the resources available, hitting the poorest countries hardest. Although the uptake of antiretroviral therapy has improved dramatically in the past decade, significant challenges remain. This medicine has to be taken for the rest of the individual's life. Therefore, more funding will be required to sustain and increase the uptake of medication and care for the ill in their later years. We must strive to educate people in Scotland and in the developing world, world to dispel the myths of HIV and AIDS. We need to build on the success of recent decades to ensure that all of those people in the developed and developing world infected with HIV and AIDS are able to access appropriate and lifelong treatment and care, that they are able to live longer and healthier lives and that their human rights are upheld. Many thanks. We now call on Patrick Harvey, after which we move to the Minister, Michael Matheson, for closing speech. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and many thanks also to Sarah Boyack for bringing this important debate. Sarah Boyack talked about the, the question of whether we can even begin to talk about the end of AIDS. And I think it's been clear for a very long time that our efforts to tackle this virus would not give way to a single magic bullet, a single a uh, quick techno fix, a, a solution that would work overnight and that we would simply uh, consign uh, the epidemic to history, but that we would have uh, a thousand defeats and a thousand victories along the way. There are more victories than defeats as humanity continues to battle this epidemic. There are more victories than defeats, but both are still with us. As a, a youth worker for an HIV agency in uh, what is long enough ago now that it feels like a past life almost, uh, there, were, there were victories and defeats on a, on a small scale uh, for myself. To see a young person coming from a, a position where you know, perhaps just a few months ago they were nervous, unsure of themselves, uh, without the knowledge and the skills to uh, even begin to think about how HIV would affect their lives, into becoming a, a young, confident person, finding their own voice, 
uh, finding the opportunity to challenge ignorance and prejudice and uh, indeed to empower others uh, to take up the same attitude uh, to HIV felt fantastic to see that, that progress uh, amongst young people. To hear uh, a 17 year old uh, quietly and, and privately confide uh, that he just had an HIV diagnosis, it's hard not to feel a, a, a better defeat and a, a sense of, well, it's hard not to beat yourself up and feel responsible for that, uh, to be honest. And those victories and defeats are continuing uh, around the world as well as in Scotland. Some things stay the same, though. HIV itself is, is in many ways changing. The, the science is continuing to develop. Our, the, the, the life chances uh, of people who are living with HIV continue to change, but some things stay the same. Sarah Boyack and others have talked about uh, the misconceptions, the ignorance, which continues uh, in our society. And people who are HIV positive would say the same. Terence Higgins Trust uh, recently published the results of their survey of, of HIV positive people uh, who talked about the misconceptions, the myths and the ignorance which they encounter on a daily basis. Uh, the most common of which being that HIV and AIDS are the same thing. That an HIV diagnosis is a death sentence. That someone with HIV can't access financial products like mortgages or life insurance. Or that they can't or shouldn't have a relationship with somebody who isn't HIV positive. And indeed, uh, the, the increasing myth that there is a cure or vaccine for HIV. As our victories continue to mount up globally, as we get closer to universal antiretroviral therapy access around the world, this is going to be an increasing challenge, preventing the idea from lodging, particularly in each new generation's uh, minds, that HIV has been solved. Because if, if antiretroviral access does become universal, and I'm sure we all uh, want to see that progress as quickly as possible, we must avoid the, the danger that it creates a perception amongst young people that HIV isn't a problem anymore. If we want to, to provide that antiretroviral access, we also need to redouble our efforts uh, on prevention as well. Uh, I look forward to the, to the Minister's comments on what we can do here in Scotland on our domestic side, as well as the contribution we can make around the world uh, to these ongoing challenges. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And thank you. Many thanks. Now I call Minister Michael Matheson to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes are there by, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I, like others, offer my congratulations to Sarah Boyack in securing time for this debate today and to... Uh, raise uh, some profile around the uh, 25th World AIDS Day, uh, which took place on uh, Sunday. Uh, you know, several speakers and their contribution have highlighted how uh, this is a topic of global importance. And it is worth uh, keeping in mind uh, uh, worldwide we are starting to see uh, the tide turning, uh, with the lowest number of new infections recorded uh, since the late 1990s. 90s and a 40-fold increase in access to treatment over the past 10 years. But despite the progress that has been made, uh, there still remains uh, the stark reality that there are still over 35 million people living with HIV and that there are some 1.6 million deaths from AIDS uh, last year. Here in Scotland, we have over 4,500 people diagnosed and living with HIV. The vast majority of these individuals are receiving specialist care. Uh, very high numbers uh, are on treatment, uh, and many will have undetectable uh, load, viral uh, loads. However, uh, in Scotland, uh, we still see nearly one new HIV diagnosis every day. And it's worth uh, keeping in mind that an estimated 22% of our HIV-positive uh, population remain undiagnosed. It's for these reasons that HIV it continues to be seen as a public health priority here in Scotland. Our policy in this area is articulated uh, through the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Viruses Framework. This is a framework uh, which is supported with almost £30 million every year. Emphasis uh, is on the importance of prevention, on testing and on diagnosis and of treatment and care uh, to those who are infected. 
The National Advisory Committee on Sexual Health and Bloodborne Viruses are responsible for taking this framework forward. It's a group which I chair, and I have on that a, a range of stakeholders from across the sector who support us in this area of policy. Members will also recognise that there have been uh, significant progress has made over the last 25 years. Thanks uh, to needle exchange programmes, uh, HIV transmission through injecting drug use is now rare, with fewer than 20 cases on year on average. Pregnant women are now routinely offered antenatal screening for HIV, and with the right care, uh, the risk of mother-to-child transmission is now less than 1%. Uh, due to treatment uh, advances, many people with HIV are now living into old age, with 31% of those who are HIV positive here in Scotland now aged over 50. But still, uh, too many people are being infected and prevention is a key priority. That is why over the last two years, we have invested almost £200,000 into research here in NHS Lothian and also in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to look at the risk behaviours amongst men who have sex with men. The results of this particular research will emerge over the coming months and it will help to inform our development and policy in the coming years here in Scotland, but it will also add to our wider knowledge in the international field and to help to support the evidence base about other measures that can be taken forward on a global basis. And of course, another area where we still need to do more is in relation to stigma and discrimination. Now, to that end, it was great to see uh, the efforts made right across the country uh, in recognition of World AIDS Day on Sunday. Uh, and I think we should congratulate HIV Scotland uh, for their Light Up Scotland campaign, with over 50 buildings across the country uh, lit up in red to mark the day. And I was pleased to arrange for uh, both St Andrew's House and Victoria Quay to participate in that event. Alongside that, we are aware that there were a range of community events taking place, again, uh, involving health boards and other uh, sectors in recognising local activity around World AIDS Day. Reducing stigma is one of the five high-level outcomes that are set out in the framework. That is why we have uh, conducted research uh, over the last year to look at what is the most effective option in taking forward a national uh, campaign in this field. Uh, the research, interestingly, uh, found that a campaign by government was more likely to increase fear and stigma. However, a campaign run by a voluntary organisation was seen as more acceptable to the public. That is why uh, we have uh, decided to fund Waverley Care uh, with more than £270,000 to deliver the Always Here campaign. It is a campaign resource uh, that has already been distributed and is being used widely across the country. And by any measure, it has so far been a successful campaign and it has also assisted in giving a voice to those living with the disease. I very much look forward to working with Waverley Care uh, in developing this and expanding the Always Here campaign over the next 12 months. So, in, officer, in looking to the future, we continue to hope that there will be a cure or a vaccine, but these remain some way off. Members will be aware that changes in the law will mean that from next year, for the first time, it will be possible to buy HIV home testing kits here in Scotland. This development should help in removing barriers to testing and to diagnosis for those who may fear stigma. And in the future, people will be able to have a test conducted by themselves in the privacy of their own home. We are already working with our partners in NHS Scotland to ensure the NHS Scotland is able to deal with any issues that arise from self-testing and HIV Scotland held a seminar last week with health boards on this very topic. So, officer, I hope I have been able to uh, emphasise to members that HIV remains a priority for this Government. Our efforts to test, diagnose and treat those affected will continue. We will continue to invest in prevention 
and we will do all we can to ensure that people living with HIV are able to live longer, healthier lives, free from stigma and discrimination. Many thanks, and many thanks for all your contributions. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.15.